Welcome to the Gospel in Acts and thanks for those contributions. It's a blessing to hear that everybody's learning something and especially when the Lord is speaking to you and you can see certain highlights in the text. It's amazing to see that. So I'm very proud of you and I'm very thankful for everybody that shared and um, I'm sure the online audience is also going to enjoy that when they get to see that. Uh, it's just to remind us again. Tonight is our last lecture. And tonight we're talking about the epilogue Christian thinking. So it's 3.7 epilogue Christian thinking. And the objective tonight is to understand how Jesus' teaching transforms us and to learn how to think like a follower of Jesus. So Jesus' teaching transforms us totally transforms us and we must also learn how to think like a follower of Jesus and you've seen through the entire course of study as we've gone through the book of Luke uh, we spoke about the parables we spoke about certain occurrences and there are certain things that we really see Dr. Luke highlights as he's writing his gospel tonight we're going to be talking about three metaphors on how to respond to Jesus' teaching now the first one that we're talking about is found in Luke chapter 5. I don't know if you've got your Bible here. You can turn to Luke chapter 5 and we're going to read from verse 37. Luke chapter 5 verse 37. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. Remember we're talking about three metaphors. This is the first one and it's talking about wine skins. What do you know about that metaphor? The wine skins. Putting new wine into old wine skins. What does that mean? Anybody else want to add something to that? So that's the practical side of it. Yeah. You take new wine, you put it in an old wine skin, in their situational context, in their historical setting. That would mean that tonight you would just hear a, a burst in your house and that wine skin would actually burst. So what does Jesus mean in terms of application? What does this actually mean? He's not talking about wine, it's a metaphor. So you're saying that it could refer to the old life and the new life and trying to mingle the two. Many of the hearers had probably also made the mistake of pouring new or unfermented wine into old brittle wineskins. As the new wineskins fermented, the old brittle wineskins being rigid would not yield to the internal pressure. So this is what Andre said. This is the, the physical event that took place. And all the hearers that listened to Jesus speaking, they understood that. So the new wine was the, the newness of the gospel uh, as exemplified by the person of Jesus. Like old wineskins, the Pharisees and indeed the entire religious system of Judaism had become too rigid to accept Jesus who could not be contained in their traditions and in their rules. So we've said this before but we had this religious community who was stuck in their ways and they had added laws for years and years and years. They had added a lot of laws. So for them it was all about that way of living and to keep to those laws, to keep to those rules. And they didn't understand Jesus. They didn't understand what he came to do. They didn't understand his mission. 
So they were in constant conflict with him. And he gives this metaphor to explain to them that the article actually has to be made new. And you'll see this in these metaphors. So when you receive Jesus, you have to be made new. It's not about just receiving the new wine, receiving the Holy Spirit, but it's about the transformation. And in the kingdom, it's about the new creation. And you'll see that consistently through these parables. A lot of times Jesus is talking about the new creation. They thinking about adding more rules. They think, thinking about living those rules out better and being more stricter. But he's saying, no, this covenant is going to be a covenant of the heart. So there's an inner transformation that takes place and then you are ready to receive the new wine. So that is sort of what this metaphor means. And then the next one, he talks about a patch. And that is found in Luke 5.36. He told them this parable, No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the garment and the patch of the new garment will make the patch worse. If you put a new patch on an old garment, that new patch is still strong and still rigid. And then that garment actually gets put under worse pressure and then that garment actually tears so it tears so he's saying you can't just put a patch on this old garment again there's this indication that transformation has to take place totally you can't just patch it every woman who sewed patches on clothes new you never sewed a patch of new material on an old garment the strong new material would pull away from the old cloth and make the hole bigger in the garment. So you would be in a worst position after you had done that. The newness of the gospel could not be combined with the legalism of the Pharisees. So you couldn't combine those two. Jesus did not come to patch up the old religious system of Judaism, with its rules, with its traditions. His purpose was to fulfill the law and to start something totally new. This is something that has to speak to us as well, because as human beings, we are prone to fall into some form of religion, especially when we've lost relationship. We get to a point where we actually have a counterfeit for relationship or an alternative for relationship becomes religion. And this is when we try and patch things. But as we've learned throughout the Gospel of Luke, when we follow Jesus, it is a total commitment to discipleship. It is following Him, taking up your cross, and it is following Him every single day. And as you follow him, he leads you into this total outer transformation. Because remember, when you receive Jesus, you have the newness of life inside of you. You become born again, spirit filled. And the outer man then has to be transformed to the image of God. And then we no longer conform, like it says in Romans 12, to the pattern of this world. But we end up being Christians where we are following Christ to that degree where our light becomes brighter and brighter and brighter. Now the religious people, they didn't quite understand this. It was difficult for them to actually understand what Jesus was saying. It was difficult for them to understand what Jesus was doing, how he was acting. Last week we spoke about, or in a previous lecture, we, we spoke about the chief tax collector and Jesus going to eat at his house. For them, that was a great challenge. They didn't understand it. But then Jesus said, listen, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And here again, when they're talking to him and they're saying to him, but why don't your disciples fast? And why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? And they're constantly throwing him with, things from the law 
that they believe he's not doing, but those things were their own implementations. It was their own implementations. A lot of things in religion today, it's our own implementations. And a lot of times when we get so religious, we lose relationship and then we become almost like organizational in the way we have our Christianity or the way we are Christians. It becomes organizational rather than relational and we don't have an impact. We don't see transformation because we lose connection with the head. And this for us, as we study these metaphors, we can really take home from these two at least that we have to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us totally and to really maintain us in that position where we are poised to hear from God, where we are positioned to hear what He's saying to us and what He's telling us. Because those who are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Remember what I said before in previous lectures. The prophetic utterances were that he was going to take the heart of stone out of us. And he was going to put a heart of flesh inside of us. And people think, if I accept the Lord with my mind, and I can keep to the rules, that is Christianity, but it's not. You accept him and receive him with your heart. You surrender your life. And you allow the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to transform you. You don't put an old patch on or try to put new wine into old wineskins and all of that. It just won't work. And it won't be successful. And you will actually be worse than you were before you were saved. Because as you can see, when you study the Gospel of Luke, these religious people were moving towards a point of plotting and planning to murder Jesus himself. And the, uh, according to historical tradition, they actually killed Lazarus after Jesus raised him from the dead. They actually went and they killed him because they didn't want him to live. Because they couldn't stand the fact that this dead man was risen to life in front of all these witnesses, and then they went back and they killed him, according to some of the historical facts that we have. And that's unfortunately how it is. Once you start in religion, and you start functioning in that sphere of human effort, you have to do it yourself. You have to constantly do it yourself, and you have to maintain it. And when you have those like religious meetings where it's very religious, and everything's been planned out, if somebody comes into the service and they're planning to kill themselves, they're planning to commit suicide, they at the end of their words, they need help, they need God to touch them, they need somebody to speak to them and to encourage them. It's impossible for that order to allow ministry to that person because there's a specific order of the way things work. But under the new covenant, it's totally different. And we have to constantly see that as we study the Gospels. And we have to accept that, that it's different. Jesus says that the man who is led by the Spirit is like the wind. You don't know where he's coming from. And you don't know where he's going to. And I know that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. Because they want to understand how is this going to work. But if you really surrender to the Lord... He will open up opportunities for you to minister His love to people. And those opportunities will be supernatural. And they will be, most of the time, at the strangest places. He will open up those opportunities for you to be the salt and to be the light. It's not a once a week effort. It's not an outreach effort. It's a lifestyle of just almost oozing you know the english have this word where they say oozing it's almost like something like a kettle the other day i was boiling the kettle and i didn't see that the the little kettle switch was stuck against the wall so when it started boiling it was like spitting out hot water like and i was like what's going on with the kettle is it attacking me or something but then it was like oozing out hot water because it was boiling and the switch was stuck so it couldn't switch itself off so when you become so hot with Jesus 
and you become so hot in the Holy Spirit and so on fire, it has to come out. <laughs> Even if it comes out like that sometimes, you know, the, everybody that's close to you gets burnt, you know. But it's a good burn. It's the burn of the gospel. And it's what people need. Like we said in previous lectures, if we don't do it, if we're not involved, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? So now we're going to talk about the third parable, which is the children in the marketplace. Now this is a tricky one because there's quite a few interpretations as far as the children in the marketplace is concerned. If you read in Luke 7, 31, Jesus says, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. What does that mean? <laughs> okay, if you read the scripture, it says, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? Who's the generation Jesus is speaking about? The generation referred to the people, many whom were religious leaders, those people around them, who had rejected John the Baptist and also rejected Jesus. Jesus condemned their attitude. No matter what Jesus said or did, they took the opposite view. By these metaphors, Jesus was saying that the scribes and the Pharisees were like the children asking him to play. So they wanted Jesus to actually do what they wanted Jesus to do. The point Jesus was making was that he and John had not come to play their little games. He and John were not going to conform to their teachings but had come to revolutionize the established religious teaching. So he came to revolutionize it. And they were, historically, these children were playing in the marketplace. And they would look at busy merchants and people and ask them to play with them in their games. These people would normally refuse. And then the children would say, you know, I, I wanted to play with you. I played the flute and you didn't dance and I did this and you didn't want to participate. And Jesus said to them, listen, we came with a purpose, me and John. John the Baptist came and he prepared the way for the Messiah. He went out in the desert and he preached. And they accused John because John fasted and he was a rough man. They looked at John and, and, and they looked at him and they, they, they you know, they, they accused him. And then they looked at Jesus and he was with sinners and he was eating and drinking. And they said, he's a glutton and they accused Jesus. And they didn't accept him. But the manifestation of God's miracle power was upon Christ's ministry. And they witnessed it. In fact, it became a big problem for them. The more Jesus manifested the power of God the more these religious leaders wanted to shut him up. They wanted to get rid of him. So Jesus says, listen guys, I haven't come to dance to your tune, to try and fit into your order, to try and be what you are, or to try and obey what you say I have to obey. I have come with the mandate and the authority of the Father to manifest the Father to the people. The only way Jesus could manifest God and his love was to actually go after the lost sheep, to go after the lost coin, to really manifest that, to accept those who people rejected. Now, not even John understood this. Not even John the Baptist really understood it. Now, John the Baptist, we know, was filled with the Holy Spirit since birth. He was a Nazarite, so he never touched wine uh, or any fermented drink. He went out into the desert and he preached and something was on his ministry and on his life. Uh, we, we read later that Jesus said it was, he came in the spirit of Elijah, like the prophetic utterance said, to prepare the way for Messiah. So he was preaching because there had to be 
the opportunity for the lost sheep of Israel to receive the new covenant. And once they said, no, we don't want it. We don't want the new covenant. That is when God actually turned the grace to the nations. So then the nations could now come in because, like Paul says, the Jews are temporarily in disobedience so that we could be grafted in to Christ as the non-Jews. But John basically ministered to the Jews, preaching. Jesus basically manifested the kingdom to the Jews with signs, miracles and wonders. And they said, Hosanna to the king, the one day, and a few days later, they said, crucify him and let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And if we want to look at the root of why, we can look at the conversation that the high priest had with the Sanhedrin when he called them together after Lazarus was risen from the dead. And there were a lot of Jews because it was only 10 kilometers away. There were a lot of Jews present. They physically saw this man be in the grave for days, jumping out of his grave clothes. It became undeniable that Jesus Christ was the Messiah because he was fulfilling prophecy by prophecy by prophecy. And then they got very nervous because what they thought was our religious order was going to be shaken to pieces. We, are not, we were not going to have a seat of power in occupied Rome. So Rome occupied the nation of Israel, but they gave the Sanhedrin certain rights and certain levels of authority, and they didn't want to lose that. So Jesus is saying here to them, listen, we haven't come here to dance when you play the flute, or to do what you want to do. We've come here with God's mandate to do the work that God has ordained for us to do. So that is what this metaphor means. Something interesting, or a few interesting facts that I want to just mention to you. Uh, Jesus says that blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John called two of his disciples and sent them to Jesus saying, are you the, the coming one or do we look for another? So John was not sure. He was sitting in prison because as you know, John was taken in prison. He was sitting in prison and he asked this question. Jesus answered that, but what, the point I want to make is that there comes a time in our lives, a lot of time when we don't understand our own ministry when we don't understand what's happening in our lives. This happened to John. Now you'll read later that Jesus says John is the greatest prophet under the Old Covenant. So if you look at Elijah, Elisha, uh, Jeremiah, all the prophets, if you look at all the prophets, he says John is the greatest of the prophets. And yet John is sitting in prison because he made some utterances about this man having his brother's wife and now he's sitting there and later we know he's beheaded and executed. But John sends his disciples to Jesus and says, are you the one or should we expect somebody else? And then Jesus starts talking in Luke chapter 7 about John and I don't want to get into that but what I want to leave with you is that it ends up to a position where Jesus says, listen, blessed is the one who's not in, offended in me. God blesses those who are not offended. And the word for offended suggests the closing of a trap. This means that if we get offended with God or with people, there's a trap waiting for us. You see, when things go wrong in your life, like in John's life, and you're sitting in that position, you will be blessed if you don't allow offense to come to you. If you walk in offense, whether it is against the person or offense against God, you end up in a position of bitterness 
And what happens is a bitter root that grows inside of you. And what happens is that everything, everything in your life is affected and infected by it. And you cannot fulfill your destiny because of that offense. So you have to be very careful. This is why when he uses that Greek word for offense in that scripture, he's talking about a trap, a trap waiting for you. I was reading in Romans 8 where Paul says, And we know that all things work for the good. He uses the words we know. He doesn't say all things work for the good. He doesn't say maybe all things work for the good. He doesn't say we think all things work for the good. He says we know. For me, that was a picture of somebody who was always in submission to God and never offended, even if something went wrong in his life. Because every time something goes wrong in your life, it's an opportunity for you to actually step off the path of your ministry. Just think of it. If Paul was offended because he was in a shipwreck, if he was offended because he was robbed when he was going to preach the gospel, he got robbed. If he was offended because he got beaten, if he was offended because he was all those times shipwrecked and he, sometimes he was cold and he was offended all the time, he would have always had these difficult and rebellious conversations with God, which many Christians have. Let's be honest. Because they don't know that all things work for the good. They hope so. They pray so. They think so. But they don't know. And I believe that God leads us to that point where we say, listen, we know. We have to get to that point where we know that God is good. Where we know that He is for us who can be against us. We, we know that we are more than conquerors through Christ. Where we know that. We have to get to that point where we know that. Because else the devil is always going to use the things around you to destabilize your Christian faith destabilize you totally and then he's going to depower you you're going to lose all your spiritual power because you're going to turn on yourself you're going to say things that you're not supposed to say because that's what offense does that's what it does so this is something that you need to really take into your spirit tonight I want to also share this truth from that scripture in Luke 7, 28. It says, For I say to you that among those born of a woman there is no greater than the prophet John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What does that mean? He who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What does that mean? So have you ever read of the miracles that the prophet Elisha did? And have you ever read of the miracles that Elijah did? I mean, these men were prophets. You know, Elijah called fire down from heaven and slaughtered all the prophets of Baal. Jesus is saying that the capacity that is within you, I'm talking to you tonight, the capacity that's within you is greater than the capacity that was within those prophets. But you have to receive that by faith. And you have to release it by faith. It takes a process to get to that level of power, but that power is within you. You have the power. You might be praying for the power, but you've got the power. You have the spirit that created the entire universe living inside of you. I mean, that's something that we don't think of when we look in the mirror, when we look at ourselves and we say, mm, you know, I'm just old Richard and, you know. 
you can't see yourself in that way. But part of Bible school and the growth process in Bible school is to move to that position where you just move into the, the revelation of who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. And here he says, the least in the kingdom is, is greater. It's very true. And I think that's what we reading throughout the Gospels as we're studying it. it. It's about that relationship we have and how the Lord leads us into the greater things, the greater works. He takes us into that. And sometimes the route to that is not an easy route. It's not the way that we would want to go. Israel was never told that there was a desert between them and the promised land. They were just waiting for the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. And imagine their surprise when they got through that Red Sea to the other side and they saw, what is this? Where are we now? This is worse than Egypt. There's nothing here. We are living in a place where there's no capacity to cultivate crops, where we're living in temperatures of extreme and all that they really had was the promise of God that there was a promised land. They never saw a promised land. But then it was about following the cloud and following the fire column and remaining under the cloud. And like we said in our previous subject, going through the tabernacle as we enter into His presence, into the Holy of Holies. And finding that capacity to hold on to Jesus. Allowing the Holy Spirit to change us into the glorious image of Christ. So we spoke about three metaphors. We had the new patch on an old garment. We had the wineskin. The old wineskin and the new wine coming in. Stating that we need this transformation and the year about uh, John we, we spoke about not being offended not allowing our circumstances to make us doubt God and to allow unbelief to enter into our hearts so that we live and even our prayers become filled with unbelief we spoke about the children in the marketplace and what Jesus said in John chapter 7 and then we want to look at two women and two different stories. The one is found in Luke chapter 7 verse 37 when a woman who had a, lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. She brought the alabaster jar of perfume and we know that she poured out this perfume on his feet. And the Pharisee who was the host of Jesus was very disgusted that Jesus allowed this woman who was a sinful woman to touch his feet. And he was thinking to himself, if this man is a prophet, he would know what type of woman was touching him. Again, that same thing about religious righteousness and not relational righteousness, but religious righteousness. And Jesus asked him in Luke 7, 41. He said, two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he cancelled both debts. Now, which of them will love him more? So what is the application of that? If we look at this woman... The sinful woman washing Jesus' feet. What is the application for us today? I mean, that is a clear picture that Jesus shows through many of these engagements with people that the community or the religious community would not accept those people. They would reject those people. Jesus didn't judge them. Even the woman caught in the act of adultery. That doesn't promote sinful living but it promotes 
grace and mercy. The Bible says that we must judge and measure as we want to be measured. And a lot of Christians forget that. We tend to be very harsh when it comes to other people. And we don't know their hearts. Nobody's excluded. And he leaves the 99 to go and find the one. The Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost today. That is the heart of God. And I've seen that in ministry for many years. I've seen how God will go after those people. And people who you think will never serve God. See how God reaches into the darkness and grabs them out there. What else can we learn from this? Now to live is hard. I mean, it's not easy to live. We go through difficulties and all of us sitting here tonight and even those online, it's not easy to live. It's not easy to be human on this planet. And we go through very difficult seasons. But the one thing that I've learned, even coming from drugs and having to really hold on to Jesus, especially those first few years where it was difficult for me, but the one thing I've learned is to just put Him first in everything that I do. Just to put Him first in everything. And to not allow the enemy to bring accusation against God in my life. And say, where's your God? What's He doing now? Why can't you pay these bills? Why are people trying to take your car? Why are, are, are you not able to do this? What's happening here? Where's your God? Because that's what the devil's going to say all the time. I remind myself of his goodness and the fact that I'm over 50 today and I wouldn't have been alive if it wasn't for him. And that is what Jesus means with this tremendous gratitude. Now I'm a man of extremes because I'm not your typical Christian who grew up religiously. Um, and so, I mean... I've shocked a lot of Christians with my behavior many times because I don't fit in that mold. But maybe I'll say the same like Jesus said, you know, I'm not dancing to your flute. And I'm not saying that in rebellion. I'm just saying that God makes us unique in the way we share the gospel. When I go into the prisons and I talk to those guys, we talk together. I'm not talking from the pulpit. I'm, we're talking together. Because I've got a story and they've got a story. And I know what their story is a lot of the times because I understand why they're there. So God has to save people from certain aspects of life to be able to go and minister to certain people and to shine that light in those areas. It actually ties up nicely with the last event that we want to discuss. And this is Jesus... Mary and Martha. So for us here, Dr. Luke is again giving us a very great practical event that we can learn from. Because we probably have a lot of Marthas sitting here tonight. Even if, you, if you're wearing a pants. Now a lot of the ladies wear pants. But you know what I mean? If you're male, they, you can also be a Martha. <laughs> If you read in Luke 10, 39, it says that she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. So, I mean... I can understand from a hostess perspective, you've got a guest coming. It's a very important guest. It's the Son of God, the Messiah. You probably want to prepare your food. You want to do everything right. Uh, and Martha was running rampant and she was distracted, but she missed the opportunity that Mary had as she was sitting at the Lord's feet and listening. Jesus said, in Luke 10, 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. Now, you might be a Martha tonight. <laughs> Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen what is better, 
and it will not be taken away from her. How can you apply this truth that you draw from this event in your own life? How can you apply it? I was busy doing computers in a church office and I was sitting there busy sorting out some stuff and all of a sudden it was as if the Holy Spirit just made me aware of what was going on in the office. And I was, it was very busy and I'm not saying that you shouldn't be busy and there shouldn't be a lot of activity. But all of a sudden I looked at it and I thought to myself, I studied the person who actually found that church movement's life and autobiography and the depth that he went in, in terms of his relationship with God. They were praying not because they had to, but they were praying because they were inspired to pray by relationship till three o'clock in the mornings. And the Holy Spirit came over them in such a powerful way that they were screaming and shouting and really rejoicing. And then a few hundred years later, you sit in the church office that was actually established in that move of the Holy Spirit. And you think to yourself that this thing has now just moved back to just the natural things of life. It started supernatural, but now it's just natural. It's, it's just going through the mechanics and going through the things and painting by numbers. Our Christianity becomes that way if we are not relational. And this is a key that we're reading here to being relational. It's not allowing the worries and, and the anxieties and the upsetness to get you to a point where you actually lose connection with Jesus and like we said last week we were talking about distraction but it's one of the greatest weapons that's currently being used so if you really think of what we said many lectures later and we've looked and we've studied the book of Luke and we've looked at all of this we see that Jesus wants us to partner with his manifesto he wants to use us to co-mission with him that means that we have to actually fulfill the mission as the body of Christ now on earth his body has gone up with him and we are the body of Christ on earth now we have to co-mission to fulfill that and that requires the endowment of power like we read where you have to wait until you are endured with power and then where you walk in that power and you remain in that power like the early church moved but it's something that we have to experience in our lives Every single one of us, not one is excluded. We all have to have that relationship. And I think a great key is the fact that it is about abiding in the vine. Just abiding there. If you abide long enough in the vine, if you abide close enough in the vine, if you abide connected enough in the vine, the result has to be fruit. The result has to be fruit. And that is what God has planned for each of us. But we have to allow that process by studying the pattern of true discipleship and then placing ourselves on that altar of self-sacrifice to really be a disciple of Christ. Not just a consumer, not just an attender of church, but the church wherever we move living bricks stones we move in his power wherever we go amen amen, amen.